I think that the old kind of throw a panel together sort of thing and people show up doesn't work the same way right now. No, so, not, not at all almost, right? Yeah. And, there, you know, there were a lot of hot topics five years ago, crypto being one of them, DeFi being one of them. Um, venture. Venture Whenever definitely being one of them. Whenever I would host a state mm -hmm. of venture capital in Utah, yeah. like five years ago, packed house. So AI is that now, right? Yeah. I mean, everybody's everybody's throwing an AI behind anything they can right now so yeah. <laughs> to keep the keep their mojo or momentum going. But I think that... Um, the startup ecosystem in Utah is, an, is at an interesting point. Uh, it's a different, definitely a different chapter than it was a few years ago. Oh, no question. So, it seems, yeah, it does seem like big events or even like those kind of medium sized events are not as critical as they once were to the growth of the ecosystem, right? I think they're all still great. And, you know, everybody will continue doing them, including us with the Silicon Sub Summit and the various things that we do. But I don't see them as like, the markers of where we're at as a community more. Remember like, I remember like when we did start SLC in 2014 mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just having that many people in a room was like, okay, this is a milestone for our community to get that many people in a room. Right. And sure. Summit and getting like 30,000 people there to the salt palace in 2020. Like, all right, that's a milestone. Not yeah. for our org, but like for the community, that's kind of crazy that our community could do something like that. Right. Now it's kind of like, I don't know. Well, I, th I think this is not too dissimilar from other ecosystems that go through a, a maturing process. Um, so right now, you know, there are plenty of good examples you can look to of startups that have come out of Utah, have been successful. I think um, that the, the old ecosystem events around like becoming an entrepreneur or starting your own business or finding venture capital, those have they're they're still out there and for sure they're still getting attendance but now we are large enough as an ecosystem that we can create verticals where you can actually begin to create events mm -hmm. and content around specific verticals and those may actually get better traction i think so too i think org, org specific to certain things yeah. um event specific to certain things yeah it just doesn't seem like events are it's interesting because I, 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 there's more events now than ever. So it's kind of interesting to say this, right? Sure. Like, so they're certainly happening. And yeah. we host uh, a lot. We there's have, a, we you host a, a lot. Yeah. Good. You probably host more than anybody. And um, so they're happening a ton, but it just doesn't <clears throat> seem like it's the same impact. Maybe impact is the right word. Overall community impact. But I do think it's probably stronger impact on those particular verticals. I think you're right. I mean, now they're large enough that you can get a lot of people yeah. coming out to them. But, um, you know, one of the things that we never want to lose as an ecosystem is our connectivity. And it's, it's really important that the founders and the leaders who have been successful in their business go back and share that knowledge and experience and make themselves available to people who are starting their businesses. Um, and as soon as we sort of lose that, we become more like a Silicon Valley and less like Utah. Yeah. Yeah. The mentorship piece is critical as well, but you've got like this whole generation coming up that kind of made hay over the fact that they weren't those people. Right. And so there's kind of like this, um, we're going to be even better than the past generation thing. We don't need the past generation thing. Why is that past generation always on stage? That type of stuff. Sure. Yeah. That there which, was a bit of that. May five, have been a mistake. Five to six years ago, I think it was. I think it is a mistake, <laughs> um, because I mean, you look at what, um, you know, some some of those, the the founders that sort of blazed the trail for the tech ecosystem, they are still actually investing in the ecosystem, and some of their investments Maybe more are the than largest VCs. Like some of these family offices um, are probably doing as many deals as local VCs. Hard, like I, I think hard of like Jeremy's, to know. Jeremy Andrews' mm -hmm. family office yep. might be the most active. I think Ryan's yep. does a lot. Um, Sconard's does a lot. It, that's another interesting thing that didn't exist like five years ago. Like family offices are now a place you could pitch your startup to and there, get money from. Yeah, there are family offices engaging in venture for sure. But the VCs, you know, the traditional VC community is also doing well. Um, I think it's, they're more, feels like they're much more selective, but they're doing well.
Yeah, I don't, I don't, have, I don't really have a finger on the pulse on the state of VC. But again, um, there's never been more money available to entrepreneurs than now. It's the same way there's never been more events. So again, like that's kind of problem solved, which wasn't solved maybe in like 2010, 2014. Like we need more money here. Problem solved. Mission accomplished there. There's, it, you know, I think the, the thing that I've learned about ecosystems is that as soon as you've solved one problem, there's, there's another one sort of that needs to be figured out. So that's the big question for Utah right now is how do we maintain the momentum? Yeah. What do you think the problem is now? Do you think that's the problem? How do we maintain momentum or what uh, are like the specific, you know, that... I think, I think that Utah is one of the weaknesses that we have as a state is that we're a sales driven, uh, tech ecosystem. And so. <clears throat> one of the best things we could do would be to invest in, um, building, uh, tech, technical and engineering and design talent um, design talent specifically is very hard to find in Utah. Just as an interesting side note, I, we could be much, much stronger on design talent. Um, it's not very cool to be a creative. Like if you think of the University of Utah or BYU, they do have the ad lab and they have a few other, but they're, they're, they really don't have incredible design, you know, um, centers of excellence. Great designers are really hard to find. They're really hard to find. So, you know, businesses need great design. They also need great product. Um, I think that our product development hasn't been what I'd call durable. So you see some companies, they build an initial product, they scale it, but then they haven't been able to maintain that, either retain their customers or sort of continue to build upon that product and continue to go to sort of the next level. So we're really good at the initial first phase of scaling. And by first phase, I mean, you know, a couple hundred million in sales, like not a small first phase, a reasonably impressive first phase. But the question is, can we maintain that and continue to grow um, for the sort of the, the decades to come? Yeah. What are some other ones that you see? Like what are some as sort of e weaknesses yeah. in the ecosystem? I think that because we have a very young population in Utah, um, we're fortunate in that we have this great pipeline of talent, but that pipeline of talent has traditionally come from fairly well-off homes. And as a result, there's a large amount of talent that doesn't, isn't quite as scrappy and hungry as, you know, maybe Utah was yeah. at one point in time in the past. And I think this is, you know, when I, when I came out of uh, college, I expected to work long hours and to have, have to kind of work my way up. Um, and this is not just Utah, obviously this is, this is yeah. a much broader thing, but I think Utah has been so fortunate that we have to be cautious about um, success being a, uh, a foregone conclusion versus something that we really have to strive for. That is something. It's so interesting. You brought that up. That is something I'm noticing as well is yeah. the lack of, I don't know. I don't know how else to say it other than work ethic, you know, like this, like you've got to put in the work that you're only successful. If you go to work and you work super hard and yeah. you work at work, you know, all, all the kind of stupid things that we, we were all saying 10 years ago are still true. Yeah. And it is fascinating that that doesn't exist anymore. Well, it does. It certainly does exist, but it's no like it's not necessarily we the expectation. Seeing. Yeah, like I remember, yeah. like get, being in this community ten years ago, it was like it was widely respected and celebrated that you would work fourteen, fifteen, sixteen hours, like late overnights, like all that type of sure. stuff. And again, we maybe that was too extreme. I mean, those are the those are some of the stripes that you earn with a startup. And there's actually some really important lessons that come through that. One important lesson that comes is that you learn what you're actually capable of under pressure. And when you have lots of capital available to you, not necessarily, not that companies necessarily do right now, mm -hmm. there is a lot of capital on the sidelines, but it's not all in the game, so to speak. But when you, when you go through that process of, geez, we've got a, we've got very minimal resources we can only depend on each other to get this done. 
then you learn what the company is capable of. And then in moments of challenge where you really need to draw on that resilience that you've built up as an org, you can go back to the, hey, we got, th we got through this before. We know how to do this. Like, let's employ those same, you know, that same tactic and we'll get through this. Yeah. What is your sense for the state of the startup tech economy in Utah right now? Well, generally, I think that I think it's harder for somebody to start a business in some ways right now because the expectation of getting to profitability is higher, which sort of makes sense. You know, that that was probably necessary. Um, I worry a bit. Utah's startup ecosystem has been frequently driven by college grads. So there's this idea, which I kind of disagree with, which is come out of college, start a company, build a tech company. And my, my view is uh, if you want in, in college, if you want to do some experimenting and learn how to build something and go through that process, great. But as soon as you're done, go to work for a great company. It could be um, a startup or a scale up, uh, but somebody or, or some company that you can truly learn from and you can learn an industry. And Utah has a lot of founders building technologies for industries that they're actually not really deeply familiar with. They've seen a, a, a market opportunity and so they've gone after that, but they don't have a decade of experience in that industry. Mm -hmm. And that means that they might get some traction, but when they really start to become a leader in the industry, they then struggle because the depth of their product or their knowledge about the industry um, doesn't doesn't give them deep oh, yeah. roots in the industry. Yeah. So I think I think Utah's strength is its young, educated, you know, uh, highly engaged workforce, and it's also its weakness because it doesn't necessarily encourage those uh, young people to go out and really just focus on an, an industry for 10 years and then come back and be a startup or build a company. Are you seeing companies other than tech uh, significantly move into kiln more than, yes. more than previously? Yeah. Yeah. I would. Yeah. That's a very good question. We, we started our, our brand here and you remember cause we launched it at the oh, yeah. Silicon Slopes tech summit oh, yeah. in 2018, yeah. um, January of 2018. We had a little booth. I think you recall. Um, and I didn't have, I had one person working with me, but what we did was we pulled people out of the crowd, put a t-shirt on them and said like, I remember like, that t-shirt. Yeah. It's a cool t-shirt. And we said, basically pretend like you're a part of our company and give t-shirts away and talk to people. That's <laughs> we awesome. kind of gave them the crash course on what Kiln was. At the time we were focused on early stage tech companies. Um, that kind of made sense because of where the ecosystem was and we were targeting early stage adopters. Now, most of our growth is coming from uh, enterprise and uh, larger companies and service-based businesses um, and not, uh, not necessarily startups. Um, we found that um, in, in the case where a startup does locate at Kiln, they're definitely doing well and they're actually raising capital uh, as compared to their peers on like a two to one ratio. So mm. companies that are based at Kiln are doing very well at raising capital. We've had, we have about six or seven companies at Kiln Lehigh right now that just closed series A raises within the last four to five months. I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive. And these aren't small rounds either. I think the reason for that is that um, serial founders tend to base themselves at Kiln because they know the headache that comes with office. Yeah. And they also know the re recruiting advantage they gain by being based at Kiln, which is about a three to 5% savings on their HR spend, meaning that they, they can recruit somebody for slightly less money because that person sees the advantage of being at Kiln. Mm -hmm. well, they're also, by the way, giving up a little less equity. I mean, if you just think of the psychology of that, if you bring, if you're starting in Uncle Joe's back office and you bring in some hotshot from, you know, BYU or somewhere else, and you're saying to them, look, um, you know, we're, go we're really going places, even though we're sitting on I Ikea furniture and like, right. you got to make sure you do your own dishes and all these things. And that idea is really good. Uh, what that 
Hotshot is going to say is, okay, well, if I'm going to come to Uncle Joe's back office and do this, I want a little more equity mm-hmm. and I want to, you know, as much pay as I can get kind of thing. But if they come into Kiln, they're like, wow, I'm going to be surrounded by all these companies. I'm going to get access to learning and development. Um, they're typically a little more amenable to uh, not not as much equity or or compensation because they value the experience that they're that they're receiving. So that's why folks like School AI and um, Proximity. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's just launched her oh, company. Yeah. She's super cool. Um, uh, you know. Uh, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of companies right What's now. What's School AI? I actually have not heard of them. Oh, that's that's Caleb. Uh, I believe it's isn't it Caleb Hicks? Maybe I'm getting oh, it wrong. Oh, okay. I know yeah, Caleb. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is his his startup. He's launched a very cool company, doing extremely well. But we've had Mobley, School AI, um, Leland, um, uh, and several others that are that are there right now, doing quite well. What's the state of the real estate market? So real estate, so let's talk about office. Yeah. Should we talk about office specifically? Yeah. So office in the downtown cores, which we would call central business districts or CBDs, struggling. Um, vacancy rates 10 to 20%, but that's just what you see in the data. The actual vacancy rate, meaning the amount of space that's actually being used, even more vacancy. And that's because people want to be located closer to where they live. The tolerance for the commute. I mean, a good example is this office right here. Yeah. <laughs> you're not in Lehigh. You're closer to where you this live. This is very much a commute <laughs> play. Yeah. It's like, so, what's the least amount I can drive that people yeah, would still so come look, here? Um, but I do think that there is a general awakening as it pertains to work from home. People are realizing that generally work from home has two primary disadvantages. The first being that younger employees are not getting mentored and taught. And it's typically the more senior members of your team that do better working from home because they really know what they're doing. So they can kind of do it from anywhere, but they're not passing along that knowledge to the next level of leadership in the company. So that's one of the main things. And it hasn't quite caught up yet, but it's starting to. People are starting to realize that that's not happening. And then the second um, thing is just overall engagement of your employee base um, when somebody's working from home, there are certain areas where they can be productive, but the overall productivity of the team can suffer. So individual productivity can do all right. Mm-hmm. Team productivity struggles. And this is especially critical when we think about the kind of competitive advantage that companies have. Most companies don't have a technology advantage. They're using the same technology yeah. that's accessible to other companies. That's particularly true now where everybody's just plugged into OpenAI. Exactly. Yeah. So they're using they're using readily available technologies. So what gives them a unique competitive advantage is their creative problem solving. And creative problem solving is not done well when everybody's sitting in their home office. And it's those moments of breakthrough that actually really turn um, a small company into something very meaningful. And the thing that's hard to calculate, cause you can't put this in a spreadsheet. You can put in a spreadsheet, like how many phone calls can I make from home? How many phone calls can I make from the office? How many emails? How many emails? You can do all of that. Mm-hmm. But what you fail to see that's never going to be captured is what's the probability. And you could, you could do this by the way. What's the probability that you're going to have a major breakthrough in either accessing your market or problem solving or coming up with the best mousetrap that you can. What's the probability of that when it's when you're working from home versus when you're in, a, in an office environment? And when we think of Kiln, Kiln's role is not just to provide the physical infrastructure, but it's actually to enable moments where people really feel like they can be their most authentic self and when they feel that way, then their best creativity comes out because they don't feel like they have to put on airs. They do feel like they're cared for and look af- looked after. Yeah. It can be as simple as like, I don't have to do my dishes. Somebody else is doing them for me. Or look, here's a, you know, a healthy snack or here's a great event that I can tap into. But it's giving that person the confidence and the permission to really express the best of themselves at work. And when they do that, that's when companies really become special. And most companies don't 
become really special. Most companies yeah. do their best to kind of eke forward, but it's only the special few that make it the, the full distance. Yeah. It's actually really rare. It is really rare. <laughs> it's like extremely, it's extremely also rare. very rare that an individual gets to experience the joy of fully expressing their own talents and abilities. Yeah. It's a yeah. rare thing. Another thing that I think Kiln is incredible at is the community aspect. Yeah. Like you're really great at community. And in particular, what I think um, community is trending towards is more curated connections, right? Yes. Where it's like this person, I want to be in the room with these five people because they can help me X way or I can learn from them or whatever it is, right? More than, hey, let's all go to the bar together or yeah, whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. those types of things. I think more curated connections is where we're headed. And so um, you've already got that nailed. You know, I don't think we do. I think we're, I think we're further along the most, but to be honest with you, the experience that our members have today is only about 20% of what we've contemplated could be the experience. And so we have a long ways to go still. Um, the, the truth is that, you know, uh, uh, our members on, have been surveyed and what they say is that on average, they're meeting somebody once every six months that makes a meaningful difference in their business. So if you think about that, you have to meet a lot of people for one person to make a meaningful difference in your business. But for the average member at Kiln, it's happening every six months. That may not seem like a lot to some people, but one relationship can make all the difference. So um, it all depends on the context, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, how often are you doing an event in there, in your spaces? We do. Most, most locations do around 15 to 20 events a month. Yeah, that's, that's a good yeah. chunk. But, you know, funny enough, the, the, some of the best connections don't come through those events. They actually come through, uh, some, some, you know, it could come when two guys are switching in the barber chair, like, yep. and say, hey, you know, nice That's to meet what you. Saying. What do you Events do? Events are interesting now. Like, like, it's really interesting, like, yeah. where our connections and meaningful connections are coming from. I, I do think you meet a lot of people at an event. What I also think happens in an event is it opens your mind to like possibilities within your own business. Oh, that's an interesting way of doing things. Oh, I never thought about that. And we all know that the genesis of an idea is usually that it has to pass through lots and lots of parties before it becomes refined enough to be something great. So even hearing about the way other people are executing on their business can be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So you have, what's the most recent one you've opened? Is it Provo? No, uh, most recent one's Littleton, Colorado. Okay, yeah. when did that open? So we're up to 14 locations opened and eight under construction. This yeah. is crazy. About $60 million of new projects underway. We've got about 5,000 members now, um, uh, just shy of 2,000 companies that have memberships at Kiln. How did you outlast WeWork? Um, you know, we work, well, we could talk a lot about this topic, Yeah. but to simplify, I would say Kiln is very, very focused on unit level economics and making sure every location stands on its own. That's the way we're structured from a corporate standpoint. That's the way the whole organization works is that we're every day. We're just focused on, is this location set up for success? Is it sustainable? Does it have the right leadership? Do we have the right programming going on? Are we connecting with the community in the right way? So it's that hyper-local focus that ultimately made, I think, a big difference. I think we work, we're, we're growing at such a pace and such a scale. And, that, and there's so many things we could talk about, valuation, corporate structure, corporate governance, leadership. Um, but, but long story short, the reason why we're successful is because we're focused on each individual location. Uh, how's Provo going? Cause I remember like, yeah. that's, I, I was on you from day one, like get a kiln in Provo. Yeah. Yeah. So Provo is going very well. We built something there that I think is nicer than what the market would have normally expected. In fact, it's the first built from scratch co-working space in the United States. So it's hard to appreciate that if you haven't spent the last 12 years going to lots of co-working spaces like I have. I mean, I, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of co-working spaces. So I can just tell you that what we have in Provo is as nice as anything in London or New York or San Francisco 
um, but it happens to be right here in Provo, Utah. So uh, helping everybody appreciate that isn't easy. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're we're not full yet, but we're close. Uh, we've we've made a lot of progress. We have a lot of incredible companies there. I think Utah startups, particularly Provo startups, um, they they want to start in a garage. They they have this ideal of that being the way to do things. Um, the most important ingredient to make a startup successful is talent. Mm-hmm. And being in a place like Kiln just enhances your ability to attract and retain that talent. So the companies that are based at Kiln are doing really well. They're, they've got great talent, more mature talent, I'd say. Um, you know, meaning that probably the average age at Kiln Provo is probably close to 35. You know, it's not like a young, young um, member there. So, What's your sense for just the state of the state overall? We're in an interesting time, right? Like I, yeah. I can't like get a grasp on like, is Utah doing really well? Are we stagnant? Are we like, it's hard for me to get a grip on what you, we're doing. You know, the, the one thing I'd point to that we need to maybe give some more focus to is we've become, I think, excellent at a startup and incubation. Mm-hmm. I think we're really, then there's lots of resources available we're getting better at scaling and scaling up still a harder phase. A lot of companies struggle to scale up and by scale up, I mean like move past 50 million in revenue. Right. And then the phase where we're really not seeing enough uh, good examples is, you know, we've had several companies get to a billion dollars, but they struggle to sort of grow past there and they've had layoffs and, we want to see that this ecosystem can produce like long-term winners. Um, I love what Ryan Smith actually said a while ago. Um, he said, you know, it, he said uh, something like the first 10 years of Qualtrics was just horrible. Like it was just a horrible experience, very difficult, you know? And so it, was, it, it took 10 years before he really started to experience success. And, and I think that, you know, Qualtrics and, and Vivint are at this very interesting stage right now where It's not necessarily the founder that's running, particularly in the case of Vivint, the founder is no longer running the business. We'd say the same thing about Divi or Bill.com. We'd probably say the same thing about Mm Pluralsight. We'd say the same thing about Weave. Mm -hmm. So the founders are no longer leading necessarily those companies. They may be, but but the ownership has changed. And so the real question is like, how do those companies continue to be titans in our market? Um, or do, do Utah companies get to a phase where they've kind of hit sort of an artificial ceiling and they struggle to move past that? You just mentioned something, mentioned something to me that I don't know that I realized before, and that is how many founders are no longer CEOs of their companies in Utah? Yeah, it's because the exits are so attractive. And it's very interesting. I get asked about exit, like, feels almost daily, but at least a couple times a week. What's your exit strategy? Like we don't have an exit strategy. We have a cash flow strategy. We just want to cash flow the business. We want the business to produce amazing cash. And that's our strategy. And they're like, well, that, I mean, why not? Why not? Because I don't really need that. That's not my focus. Mm-hmm. My focus is building a long-term durable business. You know, yesterday I drove by a little business in Provo, Utah. It still has the same paint, the same logo, the same <laughs> signage. And it's been operating for 20 years since its original founder, which was my mother. My mother started a little school, had 50 employees, 300 kids at the school. It's called Adventure Time Daycare. And to this day, it's still running, same location, same basic model. And I think there's something really cool about that. Absolutely. You know, to build something durable that lasts past your leadership, so to speak, that, that has strength in and of its own is pretty awesome. How often are you being asked, how should I, how can I raise money versus when should I raise money or should I raise money at all? You know, the, the, should I raise money at all is all about the the nature of the business. In my, in my case, you know, I'm building these physical buildings. They take about five to $6 million each. So there's just no way to bootstrap that. You have to raise money for it. I think, um, I'm very fortunate in that I, you know, have some very good investors and they really understand and they're patient and they see the direction that we're heading and they are, they're focused on that direction rather than, 
stuck on a timeline that they have to get an exit from or something like that. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I think it's a good idea to take capital. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking capital. Mm -hmm. I think you need to be thoughtful about who you take the capital from. Are they actually going to add value? Um, or are they just going to be a check? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's smart advice. How, how, uh, like, do you want to build this? Is this like your last job? Like, what do you like? This so is Kiln has do. multiple dimensions. It, 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 it will eventually have multiple dimensions. So the answer is, yeah, I'm completely, you know, I'm very, I'm very bought into what I do. I absolutely love what I do every day. Most importantly, I really love the people I get to do it with. I have a great team. I care about them. They care about each other. Um, they care about the business. They care about the mission that we're after. They care about the members. Um, so there's a lot of goodness in it. And I, I really genuinely feel like my talents and gifts and abilities fit very nicely with what I'm doing. And I feel a, a real sense of purpose in what I do. At what point, and maybe this isn't on the roadmap, but you said there's uh, various dimensions. Yes. At what point do you start making investments? Meaning from what, at what point does yeah, Kiln I mean, do a fund? You mean does Kiln become, I get, I get asked that question a lot. That's not necessarily our focus. Our focus is on becoming a lifestyle brand that sits at the intersection of life and work and enabling people to elevate the quality of their life while they're at work. And if we just took that as a thesis statement, there's all sorts of elevating the quality of life while at work. There's all sorts of opportunities to provide services and provide solutions that could be very helpful. Um, capital raising or investing, direct investing into companies is a different skill set and not necessarily one that well, it's one you have experience on. with. It's I not, do it's have. Not like it's that's one true. That you don't have though. It's I have experience with it. Yeah, you come from that. But world. my organization has not necessarily got experience with it. Yeah. So I believe that I, I have experience with acceleration, accelerating businesses through accelerators, some early stage direct investing. Uh, I I understand the fundamentals of it pretty well now, but um, I, that's really not where we're focused yeah. right now. I think we're focused more on the real estate side of the opportunity that could be. Where realized. do you expand? Is there another place in Utah you want to go or do you start well, you expanding know, we're in, outside of it? We're in six States now. Yeah. So we're in Portland, Oregon, um, Gilbert, Arizona under construction in Biltmore Phoenix area. We are in Solana beach, uh, Carlsbad, Encinitas under construction in La Jolla and Rancho Bernardo. And we've just sent in our first LOI in other parts of California, Northern California specifically. Um, we have work going on to get into Seattle. We've just opened our second location in Colorado. So we're in Boulder and Littleton. And we are about to start construction. I think I can say this. Um, it's not technically really official. So, you know, if you're one of the five People listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't don't tweet this out. But uh, yeah, Fort Collins, Colorado is where we're headed next. Fort Collins Florida. is great. It's a great town. It's such a great town. Yeah, it's great. Um, and then uh, starting to look in other states in and around the West. We're only going to stay in the West. There's tremendous opportunity in the West, enough to keep us here for the next decade at least. Yeah, I was going to say, so, at what point do you go East? But probably no need, right? Yeah. And I kind of joke is, about the East Coast. East has got a lot. Uh, the people aren't nice in the East Coast, so, you know, <laughs> the nice ones all come to the West. <laughs> what ecosystem is surprising you right now in terms of its growth and maybe under the radar? Meridian, Idaho. So we're in Meridian, Idaho right now. And uh, Kiln is completely full. Most of our offices have waiting lists on them. And it's, it's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, our location there is our largest location of any of our locations, mm. um, yeah, meaning largest under one roof. Um, Meridian's really interesting because it's got a, I think whenever you have a bit of a underdog chip on your shoulder kind of thing, you're actually in a really great place. That's the one thing I hope Utah doesn't lose. You know, we should feel like the underdogs, like we're trying to, you know, hustle our way up. And um, Meridian has that feeling right now. And, some really earnest, hardworking, brilliant people. You know, you can go to most of the great companies in Utah and you're going to find some strong Idaho gal or guy, yeah. you know, there 
who's who's kind of a rock, you know, building the company. And so you got you have that in spades in, in Meridian, but you also have companies like HP, Aflac. We actually have a team from Caterpillar based at Kiln there. Um, and there's a bunch of startups there and they've got a startup week in Boise. And I'm just really impressed with that ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. Boise, Meridian. Yeah. It's really interesting. And by the way, like Utah and Idaho are basically the same thing. Like that is the one state that I feel the most connection, connection to. Like to. I go to Boise and I'm like, oh, this is like a different version of Salt Lake. Yeah. There's been a lot of immigration into Boise, especially during the pandemic. People saw the quality of life that you could have there, live near the city, but be really close to the outdoors. And so um, I would say that the makeup of that ecosystem has changed a lot. And yeah, it feels, uh, I'll say like a little more cosmopolitan than it has maybe in the past. Yeah. It's the only state where um, we've been explicitly asked to like expand Silicon Slopes. Yeah. Which actually would make sense. Cause like it still has some slopes. slopes. Yeah. You know, like it never made sense, like going down to Phoenix or, you know, anywhere or like Colorado, sure. even Colorado has slopes, but then like, what are we doing? So yeah. Um, Silicon cacti. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know why you'd call it in Phoenix. Hey, Phoenix is a cool market. Very, That's the one that I was going to say. By well, the way. we're in Gilbert. So we're at, at Santan in Gilbert doing very well. It's a super cool location, by the way. I mean, if you, you know, Clint, you saw our, you've seen our first locations in Utah, but I really would love for you to see one of our locations out of state because yeah. they're cool. They're kind of, yeah. they have some new features to them. Um, you'll see a version of that coming up in Holiday, Utah, where we're building um, a really impressive location. We'll have a full uh, restaurant inside of it. It'll have some amazing meeting room and event capabilities. Um, and for a lot of people, it'll be a, a short bike ride away from their home. So, yeah. yeah. Arian, thanks so much for coming in, my friend. Congrats Thank on everything you. you're doing. Uh, you are a leader in this community. You've been uh, you know, one of the few community 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 first people year you. after year after year and thank you. Uh, we're better off because of it so thank you so much very much appreciate that thanks <laughs>